I would like this morning for you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. If you'd make your way over there, Luke's Gospel, chapter 9. Today, I want to talk about the spirit you are of. The spirit you are of. And in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, And it came to pass, when the time was come, that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus is heading to Jerusalem with his with his disciples and those who went along with him. He sent messengers before him, before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him. The Samaritan city did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Jesus was heading to Jerusalem. He wasn't going to stay in Samaria. So they weren't too happy about it. They didn't want him there. They put out the unwelcome mat. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them. And said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So verses 55 and 56 are going to be our key verses today. He turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Now, if you have a modern version of the Bible, if you're reading some version other than the King James or the New King James, you probably don't even have these verses in that version. Uh, That's just uh, one of the weaknesses of many of the modern translations. They leave many verses out. It's a shame that I mean, these are powerful words of Christ, and, and the modern versions don't include them. Uh, they, they are found in the majority text, which is where we get the good Bibles. <laughs> but they're left out of the modern versions. Uh, all, all it will say is, uh, he rebuked them, and they went to another village. But it leaves out the meat of the whole passage. So if you're reading from another version, well, you're just going to have to listen to what the Bible says because you can't really read it for yourself. So. <laughs> you know not what manner of spirit you are of. That's what I want to talk about, the spirit you are of, the spirit we are of. Do you know what spirit you are of, which spirit you are of? Do you know which spirit you are of? So automatically you realize there's more than one. Well, there's more than one. Uh, What sort, what spirit are you of? Well, according to Jesus, there's really only two. There's the spirit of Christ, and then there is an unholy spirit of the world, of the devil. And I want you to know that either of those spirits can at times, motivate people to do things. The Holy Spirit can motivate us, can move us, can anoint us, can lead us, but there is also an unholy spirit that, act, that can at times influence people to do things and say things they shouldn't do. I mean, if you remember, Jesus turned around and looked at Peter one time and said, Get behind me, Satan. Now, it was Was Peter demon-possessed? No. No, but there was another spirit that had motivated him and got him to 
say things and act in a way he should not have acted. So there is one spirit that activates men, motivates men, well, to do what's wrong. John's Gospel, chapter 8, and verse 44. Uh, and John's Gospel, chapter 10. John 10 and verse 10. I'm going to read both of these verses. John 10:10 10, 10 first. Uh, Jesus said, The thief cometh not, but for to kill, steal, and destroy. I am come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. John 10:10. 10, 10. The thief comes to do what? Kill, steal, destroy. The thief, that's just a synonym for the devil, for the evil spirit, the unholy spirit. Kill, steal, and destroy. This is what the devil does. Kill, steal, destroy. Jesus said, on the other hand, I am come that you might have life and life in its fullest measure. Life, a good life, a full life, a blessed life, a life blessed by God. Now, I want to make five Five observations today from this passage. You could call them five points. But the first one is this. According to the Lord Jesus Christ, we are all of one spirit or the other. We are all of one spirit or the other. Jesus was called by man Jesus of Nazareth. He was of Nazareth. What did that mean? means he came from there, that he lived there, that he was a Nazarene, that when they talked about him, he was one of them, you know, as far as that's where he was. But in John 8 and verse 44, the other passage that I said we would turn to, John 8, 44, Jesus told the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. You are of your father. You are of him. And the lust of your father you will do. Because, you know, if you're of that spirit, you do what that spirit does. Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks of himself, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But I find it interesting Jesus said you are of your father, the devil. You are of your father, the devil. Now, how did Jesus know what spirit they were of? Well, they acted like their father. It's, how, it, it's revealed in how you act, in how you speak, in how you think. John eight forty four. the lusts of your father you will do. The devil is... We know his sin, his great sin was pride, rebellion, self-will, hatred, anger, lies, violence. The lusts of your father you will do, and that brings me to a second observation I want to make today, and that is our daily life reflects what spirit we are of. Not your Sunday life. But your daily life reflects what spirit you are of, your everyday life. Now, that is reflected in your thoughts, the things you allow in here, the things you meditate on, the things you think on, your thoughts, your actions, that means your behavior, your attitudes, your everyday, everyday attitudes, Amen. your speech, the things that, all the things that comes out of your mouth. Now we're talking about actions, words, attitudes, both public and private. Your daily life reflects what spirit you are of. We know the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Right? Right? Those who are of 
their father the devil, who have that same spirit, they act like their father. They have his spiritual DNA. So the lusts of their father, they will do. Now we think of lusts, we always think of it as sexual. That's generally, that's the way we classify lust. Lust, sexual. But, you know, the word means passions. It means craving. It means desires, the lusts of your father. And they can include any kind of worldly passions. It's interesting, the word translated lust is the Greek word epithumia. Epa, which means above or over, and thumia, which has to do with heat. It's where we get our word thermos, thermal. It's something uh, that it reflects something that holds heat. So the idea, you know, something that holds heat, when the Bible speaks of lust, it means it's something you're, you're hot about. You get... You know how people get hot under the collar? They get passionate about it. They're hot-headed. That's the whole idea. The lust, the passions, the drive, the strong craving, the desire. Uh, the lusts of the, their father. They can be sexual, of course. They can be sexual lusts. Uh, or anything that makes you... Really get riled up, hot, lose your victory, lose your calm. Like some people said, oh, I'm, 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 I, lose, I lost my Christianity there for a minute. <laughs> they, they, lost, they lost something. They lost their victory, lost their peace, lost their joy, lost their testimony. Whatever witness you had to that person, you lost that. That's for sure. But... What provokes us to anger? What really pushes our buttons and gets a reaction out of us? Uh, you know, the makes a person explode. These are, you know, these passions, they're either coming from the Holy Spirit or another spirit. And what spirit are you of? That's the question we're asking. What spirit are you of? I see people get into very heated arguments. There's that word thermos, you know, thermos. Heat, hot, angry. And it can be over many things. They get, they get angry over the right-of-way on the highway. Turns into road rage and then violence. They get hot over who's going to win the, the ball game or... They get hot over politics. <clears throat> politics. Get hot over whatever. You know, they get hot over everything or anything or sometimes nothing at all. But, and then there's that passion, that heat that can draw people aside into sexual sin uh, of any kind that they give their mind and thoughts over to. Just remember... John 8, 44, it's a powerful verse. When Jesus told the religious, the religious people of his day, the Pharisees, the ones who were supposed to be the most fastidious, the ones who were the most observant of the religious laws, he told them, John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil. Imagine Jesus telling people that. You are of your father, the devil. How do you know? Because you act like him. What does the devil do? Kill, steal, and destroy. They were out to kill Jesus. If they could have killed him, they would have. They were hot. They were angry at what he taught, at what he did. Did miracles, they'd get mad because he did it on the Sabbath. And that brings me to a third point I'd like to make this morning, a third observation. And this one, this one comes closer to home. According to our text, we're in Luke chapter 9, right? Verse 55 and 56. He turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So here's my point. 
It is possible to follow Jesus Christ. It is possible to love Jesus Christ. It's possible to walk with Jesus Christ, as these disciples did, and yet forget what spirit you are of. Not permanently, but I mean temporarily, in a flash of anger, you can get motivated, you can get aggravated, irritated, instigated, <laughs> and you can forget what spirit you are of and act like, act like the devil. Now, I would remind you, that Jesus spoke this to James and John. James and John, these men love the Lord. I mean, they loved the Lord with all their hearts. They followed the Lord. They were faithful apostles. You know, James followed the Lord, loved the Lord, and was the first to be martyred, the first of the apostles to be killed. Acts chapter 12, they killed him for his faith. And John, John is called the apostle that Jesus loved. But Jesus had a nickname for these two brothers. He called them the sons of thunder. The sons of thunder. Yeah, one must have been lightning, the other one thunder. <laughs> and you know, for the Lord to give them this nickname, it had to indicate something about their nature, that... It was, it was a little bit volatile, yeah. that things could poke them and cause some kind of a reaction. <laughs> but they loved the Lord with all of their heart. They followed the Lord. And, and to show you how much people can change, you know, John lived a very long life, and he became known as the apostle of love. Amen. Of course, right here, he wasn't too loving. <laughs> Right here in this passage, he says, Lord, let's kill them all. Let's, let's, let's wipe them out. Man, woman, children, we'll kill them all. This whole village. It's possible that a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, a godly man or woman, can succumb to the influence of another spirit. Doesn't mean you're demon possessed, but it means you let the devil get your flesh in an uproar because it's flesh and the flesh pours out and it's sin. It, it shows us if it can happen to men as good and as godly as this, then we are vulnerable too. Nobody here is Superman, you know. All of us are vulnerable to this insidious influence of the world and the flesh and the devil. And, and when these things happen, I know it's never happened to any of you. You never succumbed to that influence where you blew your top, lost the victory, said things you shouldn't have said. I know it's probably never happened, but... <laughs> It shows us how vulnerable we actually are. Because just when you thought, you know, I finally got this flesh crucified. I got, I got this. Mr. Godly, I got this. And then something rises up. The wrong, boy, somebody pushes your button. Could be your husband. Could be your wife. Could be your kids. Could be anything or anybody. But if you'll notice in verse 50, what, verse 50, 54. Look at me, verse 54. James and John saw this. They saw that this Samaritan village wasn't going to welcome the Lord there. They said, Lord, just Wilt you command us to, for, to bring fire down from heaven and just burn this whole city up? I mean, burn it to the ground. 
Let's kill them all. You think that was the Holy Spirit prompting that? Or the Holy Spirit of God at work in them at this point? You think it was a fleshly work of passion? Uh, you know, let's, the gall of the Samaritan village, not, not receiving the Lord. How, how could they... How could they manifest the spirit? The Lord says, you don't know what spirit you're of. How could they not know? You don't know what manner of spirit you are of. He says in verse 56, I came not to destroy men's lives. I came to save them. Now, they'd been walking with the Lord. How'd they not realize that? He hadn't killed anybody yet. He hadn't zapped anybody with lightning yet. He didn't pull out his sword and cut somebody's head off. I mean, he wasn't Mohammed. So how could they think that the Lord would want to destroy? He said, I've, I've come to save men, and you want to kill them. And here's the thing. Those people in that city, they didn't do anything to you personally. It's not like they rejecting you. They rejecting me. You don't even know them. And you hate them. You must hate them to want to kill them all. Well, you know, his disciples did not know these people. They were Samaritans. Uh, and the Samaritans didn't welcome the Lord in their city. They didn't want him in there. They didn't want him coming to their... You're not going to stay and be diplomatic and say something good about our worship, or our religion. If you're just going to pass through, then you're not welcome. They expect you know, religious leaders to be very diplomatic. And, and bless everybody's religion and uh, everybody's practice, no matter how idolatrous it was. But uh, since the Lord wasn't going to do that, then these are Samaritans. They're actually a, a different race than us. They're a hybrid, mongrelized race. They're not like us. Let's wipe them out. I'm going to tell you, there are people in this world today who have so much anger and so much hostility. And you can't help but see uh, on the, in the news the attitudes that they display. I believe there are many. I believe there are not a few that would wipe out Christians if they could. They'd wipe out Christianity, wipe out churches. I believe they'd wipe them out if they could. But I'm going to tell you something else, I think. I think there's a lot of Christians who would wipe some people out, too. Certain communities uh, of a different political uh, spectrum would just wipe them out. Let's just wipe them out. Or wipe out those who uh, are, are of what we would consider a, a deviant sexuality. Let's just wipe them out. Be done with them. That's not the attitude of Christ. Who said he came to save men's lives. He came to save. Not to destroy. We can't allow hostility, anger, attitude towards those of a different race. Or towards those of a different nationality or ethnicity or political party or even of a different religion. We don't hate them. We might hate the spirit behind their religion, but we don't hate people. We don't hate those who hate us. We don't hate those who hate America. Hello. We can have, we can have opposite views. Complete opposite views. And even though they would want to destroy us, we have to remember the spirit we are of. Amen. 
We cannot return ugly for ugly, cursing for cursing, anger for anger. We can't be like the sons of thunder. Just want to call fire down on them all. Now, that brings me to my next point. Jesus is still saying what he said here in verse 55 and 56. He's still saying it. He said it here, but I want you to know it's still echoing through the corridors of the ages. The Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. He's come, Luke 19.10 He says he's come to seek and save the lost. That's what he's come to do. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And let's remind ourselves, Jesus is still on that mission. He's still on mission. He hasn't deviated from his purpose. Nothing has changed. He's still on mission. He's still out to seek and save the lost. John 3, 16 and 17, still true. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That the world through him might be saved. I'm glad that nobody called fire down on me when I was in my lost and stupid state. (laughs) Aren't you glad that the Lord was patient then? He's not come to destroy men's lives but to save them. He says, Romans 10, I want to read a verse, verse 17, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John, Romans chapter 10, I want to read beginning in verse 11. The scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek that the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, whosoever is a big word. Whosoever. It includes those of other nations. It includes those of different colored skin. It includes those of different political parties. It includes those who live on the other side of the tracks. It even includes the immoral. Christ died for whosoever, for whosoever, whosoever believeth in him. He said he didn't come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. Whosoever will, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you know, this is still true. This hasn't changed. The Lord is still on track, still on mission, still saving the lost. Whosoever. He still says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. First John 1, that's still true. That hasn't changed. That's how I know the Lord is still on mission. Because I open my Bible and it still says that. It still says, Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. It's still true. Confess and forsake your sins and find the mercy of God. Psalms 32, 5, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. Don't deny it. Don't deny it. Don't excuse it. But we admit it. We confess it. The psalmist said, I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. You know, he still forgives. Thank you, Lord. It's still true. Amen. Psalms 103 says he has not dealt with us after our sins or rewarded us according to our iniquities. 
That is, we don't get what we deserve. Thank God. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Psalms 103, he goes on, he says in verse 3, he forgives all of our iniquities. He heals all of our diseases. He forgives all of our iniquities. This is still true also. I remind us of these things because every one of us have, have been in the flesh before. Every one of us has fallen short. Even as Christians walking with the Lord, we've said stupid things, thought stupid things, done stupid things, failed, sometimes failed repeatedly, sometimes failed miserably. Isn't it good that the Lord forgives and the Lord washes us clean? We can still find cleansing in the blood of Calvary. We can return to that fountain filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And you know what else is still true? We just finished studying 2 Peter. Where the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack, as men count slackness, but he is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's will is that all should repent. And, and like I said, I'm glad he didn't call down fire and, and, and lightning and thunder upon me when I was living stupid, but that... He was merciful. So it's not up to you and me to call down fire. It's up to us to remember that the Lord loved those, even those angry, violent people, the Lord loves them. His is the example that we follow. His life, his words, his teaching. And he's still saying, that the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. He's still come to rescue the perishing. He's still here to seek and save the lost. That's his mission. He's still on mission, and he gives us that great commission that we're to carry it out as well. We're to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. The world needs to hear it. Every person, every place, they need to hear it. Whose responsibility is it to tell them? Is it the politician's responsibility to bring the gospel to the world? Is it the entertainment industry's responsibility? Do we leave it to Hollywood? Do we leave it to the news media? Is it up to them to bring the gospel to the whole world? No, it's up to you and me. We're the disciples of Christ. He turned to his disciples. He said, go ye, Mark 16, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The world needs to hear that Jesus saves, that Jesus changes lives. And this commission is given to each and every one of us He's still on mission. Have we lost track of what his mission is? Have we lost sight of it, that it's to seek and save the lost? Yes. Not to just go around condemning, not to want to call fire down on everybody, condemn everybody to hell. That's not our place. Amen. We don't approve of people's actions. I mean, sometimes, let's admit, we don't approve of our own actions. <laughs> but we have to remember, these are people that Christ loves. And he is on mission. Let's be aware, he's on mission. You come across people in your daily life that the Lord gives you an opportunity to speak to. We're supposed to be on mission as well. Brings me to my fifth important observation today, and that is that believers, 
believers, that's you and me, even the, the true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, every true believer must guard himself or herself against deep-seated prejudices and biases. We must guard ourselves against deep-seated prejudices and biases. Because I want you to know, you're not immune. You are not immune. We all grew up in different kinds of homes. Maybe you grew up in a home that was very biased or very prejudiced. Maybe you didn't. Maybe that was not instilled in you. But you're, you've been around people who are very biased and very prejudiced. You've, been, you've heard them. You, we, we have a media that bombards us continually with bias and prejudices. Their, their intent, I believe, is to divide us. But I want you to notice again that it was James and John that expressed this towards the Samaritans. Let's just wipe this village off the face of the earth. These are good men. These are godly men. But I want you to know it's possible that something from their Jewish background Something from their Jewish heritage. They inherited a deep-seated bias or prejudice against the Samaritan people, the Samaritan race. You know, the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. Nothing to do with them at all. It goes back not just a few years, but hundreds of years, hundreds of years, when Assyria conquered the northern tribes of, of Israel, 700 years before Christ, the northern tribes were, caught, were carried off into Assyrian captivity. And then the Assyrians took people from Syria and Iraq, they took people from Babylon. In fact, the Bible says it, Second Kings chapter 17, there's a passage over there in verse 24. It says, the king of Assyria took the populations from Babylon, from Cutha, from Ava, from Hamath, and from Sepharium, and brought them to the northern empire and settled them there. And those people intermarried with what Jews were left, and that's how the Samaritan race came to be. They were a hybrid race, a hybridized race. They established their own religion. They built their own temple, an elaborate temple on Mount Gerizim. They worshipped there. They were kind of in competition with the Jews. The Jews despised them. They said, you're a false race, you're a mongrelized race, you have no part with us. They said, you have a false religion. You might even remember when Jesus came to the well in Samaria, and he told the Samaritan woman, would you draw some, some water for me from the well? And she says, you're a Jew. Y'all have nothing to do with us. Why, why would you ask me to draw water? from the well for you. She was astounded that a Jew even talked to her and would, and would drink from some water that she drew from the well. And she even told the Lord, one of the things she said was that our fathers, our ancestors say that we should worship on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. This is where we're supposed to worship, even though the temple there had been gone now for a hundred years or more. And then, she, and then she told the Lord, but you say, we, we, you Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem. So which is it? And Jesus said, well, a time's coming. Well, you won't be worshiping on this mountain or in any other human temple. But he said, because the time is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And that's what he's looking for, true worshipers who will worship in spirit and truth. But... The animosity, the prejudice, and the bias against the Samaritans went back for seven, almost 700 years. Went back for hundreds of Now, that's what you call 
a deep-seated prejudice. When it's ingrained in all of Judaism, that's why the parable of the Good Samaritan was so shocking uh, to the Jews that a Samaritan would, would take care of a Jew when the Jews were so biased against the Samaritans. Well, you know, a history like that, even when a person gets saved, even when they're following the Lord, even when you, you know that you don't hate people just because of their heritage, their ethnicity, the color of their skin, their nationality. You, you know you don't. But isn't it something? How an old, deep-seated prejudice could rise up and come out of their mouth. Let's just erase these people from the face of the earth. I want you to know the Lord has no prejudices. Amen. And he has no biases. And while he did not approve of the Samaritan religion, not by any way, man, or shape, or form, he didn't hate them. We have to guard our hearts. I want to tell you right now, our nation yeah. is very divided. Yeah. And it's very important that you and I guard our hearts from bias and prejudice. Because even though yeah. you are saved, filled with God's Holy Spirit, the tensions are so high, the divisions are so severe, uh, it's like everything is supercharged right now. Political divisions supercharged. The divisions are so severe. The racial tension. So it's very easy, very easy to be influenced by what's going on around you. Amen. You have to remember. You rem remind yourself, beloved, the spirit you are of. You are not of this world spirit. You are not like them. You are not one of them. You are of another spirit. We have to guard our hearts against this because it's a defiling, it's a defiling thing that makes people so hostile, angry, Amen. bitter, resentful towards people you don't even know. Amen. They didn't do you anything. Right. But prejudice, unfortunately, is alive and well in every corner of the world. There's no place you can go in the world where it's not present. But it should never be present in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It might be present in the world, but let it not be present among us. You and me, we have to remember what spirit we are of. Always. Stay on mission. We, we stay on mission. Be the salt. Be the light. Be the witness. Don't join in the chaos. Don't add to the confusion. Jesus did not get drawn into the confusion. When they, they said, this city has rejected you. They don't want you coming in. He said, let's kill them all. No, no that's not what he said at all. He said, you don't know what spirit you're of. You go to another city. He actually told his disciples, if they receive you, then, then bless them. If they don't, then you go somewhere else. Wipe the dust off your feet, go somewhere else. You let the Lord deal with those who are rebellious and defiant. It's not up to you. You're not the punisher. The Lord is the punisher. You pray for him. You live, you live like a Christian ought to live. And, and I, I want to remind you of just one last thing. I'm, I'm going to quit here in just a minute. But you know, right now, there are places in the world where if we would have had the ability, we might have called fire down on some of those places. Places like Iran, like this enemy of America, this enemy of Israel. I mean, these evil ayatollahs and these evil generals that just want to destroy Israel and destroy America. They hate Americans. I tell you, there's Christians who'd call fire down on them if they could. But I want you to know one of the greatest revivals in the world is happening in Iran right now. 
Right now, Christ is saving people all over Iran and all over Muslim countries. We would have destroyed them. But God had other plans. Remember, he comes to seek and save the lost. And he's saving people right now behind that horrible Muslim curtain. He's saving people right now. He's still on mission. China is another enemy of the United States, a very rabid enemy. And we don't even know their evil intent towards the United States of America. They are a great evil empire. And I believe there are many who would wipe them out, call fire and lightning down on them if they could. But again, a great move of God's Holy Spirit is taking place in China. Behind that communist curtain, multitudes being saved. Multitudes coming to Christ. Remember, the Lord isn't slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Don't join the animosity. Don't add your voice to the chaos, to the hate, to the bias. <coughs> Excuse me. Multitudes are being saved in parts of the world where the regimes are the harshest and the most anti-Christian. Even now, I'm hearing reports, because I, I, I'm, I'm kind of chuckling because there are people who would call down fire on California, I think, if, if they could. <laughs> but even now, I'm hearing reports of a, a great move of God's Spirit in parts of California, where... Multitudes of people getting saved in the midst of the crazy Christ is working. In the midst of the chaos, people are realizing how lost, how empty, how needy they are, how vulnerable they are. They need Jesus. Hey, this is the time for the church to shine. This is the time for us to shine the light of the gospel and not go out hating, but go out shining the light of Christ who forgives, who saves, who changes lives. People need Jesus more than ever before. More than ever. And they're not going to get him. How are they going to get him? Not going to get him from the media. And they're not going to get him from us if we're acting like the rest of them. Because then you have nothing to offer. Lord Jesus, help us to stay on mission. And to root out of our heart, our mind, and our thoughts all that is unworthy of a disciple of Christ. If Christ said we, we turn the other cheek, we love our enemies, we go the second mile, then this is your call and mine. Today I'm challenging, I'm calling for you and me to stay on mission. To ask the Lord even right now to root out any bias, bitterness, prejudice, that any vestige of it in our own heart or mind, any, any evil intent, hatred, animosity towards others, it doesn't matter if they're of a different political persuasion or a different nation or even a different religion. You can't hate Muslims. You can't hate Buddhists. You can't hate those who practice witchcraft. You can't hate them. Christ died for the sins of all. And all can repent. There's none of them that are past saving. There's probably people who thought you were too far gone. That there was no hope for you. Let's pray. Father, I, I pray that you help us today to, to stay on task, to stay on mission. And that is to live our lives for you in a way that honors you and glorifies you. Lord, I pray that you cleanse our hearts and minds, our attitudes, 
Cleanse us, Lord, of every attitude, every thought, every bias, every prejudice, all that is unworthy of you. Cleanse us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Wash us, Lord. Our desire, Lord, is to stay on mission. This is, this is still your task, and it's still our call. Help us, Lord, I pray, to not add our voices to the chaos and confusion of the world. But, Lord, let us, let us have a clarion, clear voice, that voice being that Jesus saves, he fills the empty heart, he changes and transforms lives. He is our one and only hope. Help us, Lord, to stay on task. Lord, I pray against any spirit of anger, any inherited, any inherited spirits of prejudice or bias. Lord Jesus, root it out of us, I pray, right now. As we renounce it, we repent of it, we rebuke it in the name of Jesus from our own hearts and minds. Rid us of every piece of it, we pray. Lord, help us to remember that you made of all nations one blood and that you died for all. Lord, this, this is our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.